Good morning, church family. Let's do that one more time. Good morning, church family, and happy Sabbath. Amen. Praise the Lord. David said, I was happy when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Uh, one of the passages that I love in the Bible is 3 John uh, verse 2, verse 3, and verse 4. It reads, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospereth. For I rejoiced greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as you walk in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth. It is my prayer this morning that we may be able to be refreshed spiritually, mentally, and physically as well as we listen to the word of God this morning. I would like to welcome you all, those who are tuning in via live stream. I would encourage you to share the link with your loved ones so that we can all enjoy the blessing of the gospel. I would like to welcome those who are in the sanctuary in person and those who are still trickling in as well. Welcome. We would love to connect with you. If you look in front of your pews, if you're joining us for the first time, there's a card that says connect. It's a blue and white card in front of you in the pews. So if you fill that out and uh, give it to the deacons or uh, leave it by the deacon's desk, would love to connect with you as well. Those who are online, there's a link to the connect card. If you go to villagesda.org, you go to contact us, there's a drop down menu, you find the connect card there as well. Today in your bulletins, you have a bulletin insert. On the front side, there are instructions on how to download the application for the church directory. Now the church directory is very handy. I've used it so many times. Sometimes I would hear a name and I don't know the face to the name. I would go in the church directory and type in the name and uh, find out that, who that person is. So if you are a member of this church and you would like to connect with so many people, download the uh, church directory app as well. Uh, you would notice those who have the app already, there are some names that don't have pictures. So I would highly encourage you if your name doesn't have a picture in the directory, Please see me or uh, just tell the deacons at the deacon's desk to put your name down that you would like your picture to be taken, and we can arrange to, to make that happen. Uh, at the back side of that bulletin insert as well, the instructions on how to sign up for one call, text messages, and even voice calls as well. So during the week, we sometimes, uh, we, a lot of times, we send the announcements of events that are coming and uh, different kinds of things that will be happening in the church through text messages, uh, through one call and uh, calls as well. So if you'd like to sign up for that, please follow the instructions uh, on that uh, bulletin insert as well. Prayer meeting is still uh, going on on Wednesdays, 6.20. So invite your friends and your loved ones to come in person if they're in the area or to tune in via, via live stream. Now is the time to register our kids for the new school year that is coming up, 2021-2022 school year. So Village Seventh-day Adventist Elementary School, which is under the umbrella of this church, it is open now for registration. So if you know families that have students or kids that are elementary age, please invite them, pass the word around. The information, uh, contact information for our principal uh, Mr. Mark Bagby is in your bulletin, so contact him or uh, contact the school as well. Note also in your bulletins that uh, there are positions that are available at our school. Uh, the Director of Extended Education, Extended Education staff, and the kitchen positions are available. So um, if you know someone uh, who would be interested to serve in this capacity at our school, please notify them or contact our principal. Uh, I have a reminder for this afternoon, uh, the memorial service for Jim Jordan will be held at the Groove on the Andrews campus today at 4 p.m. So let us keep praying for, for the family and um, let us bring our comfort and our presence there so that the family will be comforted. The Montana project is still moving along and it is exciting that it is getting closer and closer each time we have a group go up there. The Stevensville group is going to be going I believe tomorrow, and um, in August, from August 11 to 20, a group from this church is going to go up there in Montana to be able to do some work at the project, uh, at the church there. So if you would like to participate in this upcoming trip, 
please see Pastor Dennis or contact the office uh, sometime, um, so sometime before the, these dates come up. And um, there is a project that has been going on. Uh, not a lot of people knew about it, but there have been a few of you that have been able to participate in helping a young man out of Duarjek to renovate his house. So if you'd like to participate in this project, please see John Hinko or contact Pastor Dennis. Uh, that has been a great work to help our, um, our people who are in our community as well. Our fundraisers are moving along. Uh, there should be a slide that is uh, uh, on, the, on the screens right there. As you can see, there's been great things happening and uh, people, a lot of you have been giving. So I would like to give this invitation to you that you may continue to give to these two fundraisers for our roof and for, for, for the site of our school that will, be, uh, that will be allowing us to do a lot more outdoor education and follow the ABC of education as we are given in the spirit of prophecy. Uh, today, I want to recognize um, Dr. Richard Clark's family that is amongst us, and they're here in town to help him, uh, to, to be with him to celebrate his 93rd birthday. So we want to praise the Lord for a long life of service. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord for a long life. Um, the church board acting as the nominating committee has uh, recommendations of, um, of names that will serve in this upcoming year as church officers. So if you look in your bulletin, um, if you open inside on the right side, I'm going to read these names and we are going to vote on them. There is a beginner's assistant, which is Marty Marsh, and junior's assistant, Desiree uh, Dunamis, a receipt clerk, Kathy Sturgis, and church clerk, Elizabeth Hart. So this comes as a motion from the nominating committee, which is the church board at this time. Do I have a second? Yes, I see a second. All in favor say aye. Opposed by the same sign. I don't see any hand, it's carried. So let us pray for all these individuals so that God will use them. Uh, today, I have a long list of uh, transfers in and out. So the transfers the transfers out uh, in your bulletin as well as the transfers in. Um, so I'm going to start with the transfers out. I'm, going, I'm not going to read all of them, the transfers out, but you can take a look uh, at them in your bulletin. So this comes as a motion from the church board. Do I have a second? I see the second. All in favor say aye. Opposed by the same sign. I don't see any hand. It's carried. For those transfers in, we do have pictures uh, and slides so that we can attach the names to the faces and welcome these people to, 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 our, to our church. And uh, I'm going to have the, the AV put up the pictures. We have John and uh, Marilyn Bill. Next slide. We have Gil and Colleen Bell. Next slide. We have Mark and Susan Bugby. This is our school principal. Next slide. We have Darren and Casey Heslop and the little Eva. We have City Heslop. We have Daniel Hosford. We have John uh, and uh, we have John Kelly. So I'll, I'll just give a note here that uh, Sally is not here transferring with John because she still has responsibilities at her church where she is working remotely as well. So. We'll, we'll look forward to, to have her here in, uh, in the time to come. Next slide. We have Robert uh, IV and uh, Deborah Little. We have Travis and Patricia Rader. And we have Karen Robinson. We have Linda Salem. I think this is the last one. Do we have another one? Yes, we have uh, Yoshihito Theo. I think that was the, the last one. So these are the new transfers in. We are so delighted and we're so glad to see uh, new members joining our church. So this is coming as a motion from the church board. Do I have a second? I see a second. All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed by the same sign? I don't see any hand. So it's, it's carried. So let us welcome them. Uh, let us 
help them to integrate well into our, into our church community. Uh, one more thing that I would like uh, to highlight here, the flowers that you're seeing here in front, they're in honor of um, the Habenix 60th anniversary, wedding anniversary. So when we see them, let us congratulate them and uh, celebrate with them uh, for a long marriage. I would like to, um, to just correct something in your bulletins. Um, on, the, on the same note, in your bulletin it says flowers in order of uh, Bill Habenick. It's supposed to be Don, not Bill. So let's just take a note uh, to, 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 to that fact as well. So it is time now for us to transition into the church service. Let's prepare our hearts for worship. Give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing psalms to him, talk of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name, let the hearts of those rejoice who seek the Lord. Seek the Lord and his strength, seek his face forevermore. Remember his marvelous works which he has done, his wonders and the judgments of his mouth. Thank you, Father, for all you have done. Please be in our presence today and bless us this Sabbath day, we pray. Amen.
Thank you. You may be seated. Let's continue singing our praises to the Lord. If you'll turn in your hymnals to number two, all creatures of our God and King. we're going to continue to praise God for all the beautiful things that he has made on this earth. Most importantly, his glory adds to the beauty of this uh, world. And so turn with us as we sing number 93, All Things Bright and Beautiful. Thank you. 
think how beautiful it will be in God's new kingdom. On that bright and cloudless morning when the dead in Christ shall rise and the glory of his resurrection share, when the chosen ones shall gather to their home beyond the skies and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Join with me as we sing hymn number 216. here and you can put your baskets in our bigger baskets. So go to the back of the church first and you can get your basket and then come on up front and just have a seat up here on the front of our stairs. It's good to be back to normal.
offerings. For months, I stood up here, and all I see is a sea of adults. And I'm to know that, yes, there are children out in our sanctuary. All right. I brought something in for us to talk about this morning, and that's this. What, what are these? Flowers. Flowers. Excellent. Good job. And, uh, oh, I helped Aaron. Now I lost him. One of the nice things about flowers is they have a fragrance. And I've brought two flowers in that are really good. Fragrance means you can smell them. And for you young children, the way you smell is you close your mouth and you breathe in through your nose. And then you'll smell things. So, David, I'd like you to take this first one. flocks and if you'll just slowly take it there so they can get it up give them a good sniff and we have a picture of the flocks up here beautiful summer flower and we're so blessed in spring and summer so first we have the flowers in the trees and now we have the flowers coming uh, from seeds and other things that we planted the second plant I have is milkweed my milkweed looked much better first service than it did here Milkweed is not a cut flower, but milkweed has a wonderful aroma. And can you smell in there? Can you smell that? Yeah. How does that smell? That smells good. Yeah, it's good. I think women would like to have milkweed perfume. Mm-mm. There, isn't that good? Oh, yeah. Fragrance. Lots of them. Let me just give you a good sniff. Yeah, see? I've had these sitting by me in the front pew, and the, the aroma just keeps coming up to me. There. Yeah. There. All right. And that's the unfortunate thing about a live stream, is we haven't perfected the way to put aromas through it yet. Uh, yeah, and you have flowers right here. Do the roses smell? Do the... Some do and some don't. Okay, good. You can put that down. That's fine. All right. I have a question for you. Do you think there will be flowers in heaven? What do you think? Yes. Yeah. Yes? Yeah. How do you know there will be flowers in heaven? The Bible. The Bible. Yeah. Um, I haven't found in the Bible where it says specifically on the flowers, but Sister White has told us that uh, when Adam sinned, he was in the Garden of Eden. And that garden was taken up to heaven, and when we all go with Adam up to heaven, we're going to enter that garden, and Adam will get to see the very flowers and trees that he took care of while it was here on earth. Now, in heaven, do you have... Do you have rules in your house? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes we call them laws, but we call them rules. What, what's one of the rules you have in your house? What do you think? What? Make your bed. Make your bed. Good rule. Good habit to begin with. Don't play on Sabbath. Uh, don't play on Sabbath. Well, some things uh, we don't do on Sabbath. Yes, David? Don't eat candy when you're sick. Don't eat candy when you're sick. See, that's called wisdom. Very good. Okay, now, God has law in heaven. Sometimes we call them rules, sometimes we call them law. God has one law, just one law in heaven, and that one law is summed up in one word. That's easy to remember. And that word is love, love, unselfish love love. What, is, what does it mean to be selfish? You ever, you ever have that? You ever been around that? 
What's it mean? That means to not share something like you don't want to share and you just want to keep it all to yourself because you want to be self. Oh, that's right. Perfect. Not share and keep it all to yourself. So selfish means about myself. In heaven, there is no selfish. It's all unselfish. But we got a problem here. We live on an earth that's full of selfishness. So God says, I've got to show them tokens of my love for them. I'm going to show them things to make them think of sharing and giving. The sun gives it sunshine. The clouds give us rain, to share water, and the flowers share too. Now, how do flowers share? What do they give to us? Hmm, what do you think? Well, I'll give you a clue. One thing, what did you just do with these flowers? Plant them in the garden. Plant them in the garden. Flowers share their fragrance with us. If you're lucky enough to go to Florida in March, when all the orange trees are blooming, there is such a beautiful fragrance and it's so strong, you can be in your car and drive for miles and all you smell is this beautiful fragrance. And I think in heaven, it'll be the same way. You don't have to stick your nose in the flower. You'll go by here and here and there'll be continuous, different, different, different fragrances. Uh, what's another way flowers share and give to us? Well, are they all just black? No, colors. They share their beautiful colors with us. Red, I think every color of the rainbow. Can you think of flowers that would match that? I think there are even green flowers will work. All the flowers continually sharing. And then even when, oh, and the flowers also, and they shifted it. In the flower, there's something called nectar. And that's food for the bees and for the butterflies. And that helps keep them alive and takes care of them. And when the flower is all done and it's all withered away, there's something left. Maybe even the most important thing. And what is that? Uh, seeds. seeds, right. You, in order to have seeds, you have to have flowers. And so what are some important seeds that you know? You just don't think about it. Yeah. Apple seeds. Apple seeds, because you need a seed to make the fruit. And if you have no seed, you don't get the fruit. So peaches, apples, cherries, what else? Strawberries. Strawberries, that's right. Watermelon. Watermelon, oh, good, yes. Uh, pears. Raspberries. Raspberries, yeah. Now there are other seeds you don't think about. How about? Wheat and corn and oats, those all came from flowers too. All the seeds giving to us. See, God wants us to get the idea that with him, it's all about sharing, making people's lives better, being unselfish. I hope on Sabbath, as you go take your walks and get outside, that you watch for the flowers, look at them, smell them and be reminded that this is what God wants me to be like, not selfish, but sharing and giving. Let me pray with you. Dear Father, we thank you so much for the things in nature you put out there to remind us of your love for us and help us to share and be loving in the same way that you are. Amen. Good job. Thank you very much. You may go back to your seats. If A.V. would uh, get up my slides, please. For the last, oh, about a dozen years, much of the time I have spent working on a project for Adventist Mission. And that has been assessing the status of the Adventist church work among all the language groups around the world. I want to focus this morning, or this noon, I guess it is, just on a few of those areas. 
The first is the West Central Africa Division. And the West Central Africa Division has almost 1,800 different languages. That's the most of any of the divisions of the church. The next is the Southern Asia Pacific Division with about 1,650 different languages. And the third is the South Pacific Division with about 1,350, 1,350 different languages. Together, those three divisions account for or have two-thirds of the world's languages in just those three divisions. Now, what is the status of Adventist work among those divisions, in those divisions, among the language groups? Well, in the West Central Africa Division, 88% of the language groups are still unreached. In the Southern Asia Pacific Division, 86% of the language groups are still unreached. And in the South Pacific Division, 75% of the language groups are still unreached. <coughs> so that's an average of 83% of the language groups in these three divisions that have two-thirds of the world's language, languages, 83% of the language groups are still unreached. That represents about 572 million people, more than half a billion people in just those three divisions. Now, when we were studying the Sabbath School lesson this morning, we talked a bit about uh, the report of the spies and how Caleb and Joshua appealed and said, we are able to do it. When we hear things like I've just shared with you, some people say, feel like throwing up their hands and saying, man, all this time and this is all the further we've gotten. We like Caleb and Joshua can and should have the attitude, the faith, that this is doable. It really is. I could go into that a lot more, but I don't have time to. This morning, the loose offering is for the world budget, of which a portion goes for these mission activities. I will ask the deacons to come forward and uh, please give to this purpose. Of course, you can give here. You can also give online, which is what we do.
Father, we do praise you for giving us the opportunity to be co-workers with you, to share your love, your ability, and willingness to save to the uttermost. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our scripture reading is found in James chapter two, chapter four, verse seven to 10. Submit therefore to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. Amen. Those who are able, let us kneel in prayer. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we come before your throne this morning. We would like to thank you for this opportunity that you have given us to come into your house of worship. David said, I was happy when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. This is where we can lay our burdens. As you said, come unto me, ye who are labored and heavily laden and I will give you rest. I would like to uplift your children this morning, my father, who have different kinds of burdens. Some have things that they cannot share with their friends or even their families. But I want to pray for the blood of Jesus Christ to give them comfort and peace, knowing that they can do all things through you who give them strength. Lord, as we see around us, the clouds are gathering, and there's a lot that is happening in this world that if we are not grounded in you, we are tempted to be afraid. But help us, Lord, to have our confidence and our peace and our comfort in you, knowing that you are still in control. I'd like to pray for those who have lost their loved ones. My heart goes to the Miller family, be it Sharon, and the rest of the family, and other families that have lost their loved ones here in this congregation. And I would like to pray for those who are not feeling well, those who are sick, those who have come to the sanctuary, and those who are at home. 
May your hand of healing that you showed us through the blood of Jesus Christ, may, it be, may the hand be upon each and every person and give them wholeness and healing of mental, spiritual, and physical. And Lord, this morning I would like to pray for Pastor Dennis as he breaks the bread. Lord, touch his lips and give him the message that your children, that you would like your children to hear so that we all can be drawn to the foot of the cross and prepare for your soon coming. We believe with all our hearts that your coming is even at the door and help us to be ready and to prepare. We pray thanking you for the Sabbath and we pray that your holy presence will be upon us so that we'll be refreshed by you and by your spirit. We pray all this in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. church family. I thank them for that beautiful song. Is it well with your soul today? 
Amen. I pray so. I am blessed to be here among everybody. And I remember when I was a child that growing up, and maybe some of you can relate to this, uh, there was a lot of opportunity to trade uh, maybe baseball cards or uh, marbles or rocks or something that you were collecting, and you would see that somebody had something that you had, or did not have, I mean, and uh, you valued that. And that person valued it much too. And you'd have to come to them and say, look, I'll give you three of these or maybe four of these for that one thing. How many of you have done that when you're younger, when you're growing up? You know, today there's a lot of other things that are being traded and people uh, have interest in, in coins and other things. I remember not long ago hearing about a story of a man that had a paperclip. And he thought he could persuade somebody to give him an ink pen for a paperclip. His ultimate goal was someday to go from a paperclip to a house. Does that sound like a good goal? <laughs> Believe it or not, he made it. All along the way, he persuaded somebody to give him something better or of more value for what he had. And you know, it's interesting how we often trade up but what Satan is seeking to do to God's people today and what he accomplished in the fall of Adam and Eve was to get them to exchange and trade down. And today I want to spend a little time looking at the story there in Genesis chapter 3 that we may be able to draw a couple highlights from it. There's many you could draw out, but a few highlights that perhaps significantly impact our lives. I invite you to bow your heads with me as I kneel and pray and ask for God's blessing. Gracious, loving Father, we've come to hear your voice today. We've come to gather into your presence. You've heard our singing, our praises, our gratitude and appreciation. But now, Lord, we ask that you'll come down and you'll speak to us individually and collectively as a body. Not only to us, but all those watching online and those that will watch later. Father, may your spirit take my mind and may you speak and may I be hid behind the cross that only you are heard, Lord, and that we may gather from your word what you'd have us receive this day, that we will not leave as we have come. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. <clears throat> Turn with me to Genesis chapter 3. And while you're going there, I'm going to read a little quote from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 45. It says, man was formed in the likeness of God. His nature was in harmony with the will of God. His mind was capable of comprehending divine things. His affections were pure, his appetites and passions were under the control of reason. He was holy and happy and bearing the image of God and in perfect obedience to his will. When you look at the first couple of chapters, you'll notice that everything that God had made was perfect in beauty, and he withheld nothing that was for their benefit and for their happiness. He gave them everything. He can, you could say he gave them abundance. And I do believe that with that, as he told them that if they ate from that one particular tree, telling them he could eat from all the other trees, but from that one particular tree, if they ate from that, they would die. And I'm sure like any good parent that tells their children as they're growing up about bad things that would happen to them if they do certain things, and that they should not talk to strangers. How many of you told your children not to talk to strangers when they are growing up? Just a couple of you? Yeah, a lot of you, right? I think all of you that have children probably told your children that. Don't talk to strangers. I am sure and fully persuaded that God told Adam and Eve, be careful of who you talk to. And more so, warn them about Satan and his objection, his object to take them and separate them from him. 
So I would believe that as Eve was beginning to investigate that which God had chosen to withhold, God had alerted her of her danger ahead. When I was in the Marine Corps, and as a teenager, I remember, and this was before I ever knew there was a God or believed there was a God. I had never read the Bible. I knew nothing about uh, certain things God had said in regards to lifestyle. And the group of us, as we were traveling from one place to another on a plane, we, we were talking about getting tattoos. And we were all worked up about it, and we were all excited. And, and I remember exactly where I was sitting on that plane. I was all the way in the back, about the third seat from the back, and the aisle seat. And as we were talking about this, I distinctly remember my conscience being pricked, and I heard the voice say, don't do that. Now, I didn't understand that voice. I didn't know where it was coming from, and I don't know why it was there or why not. Why shouldn't I do it? But later in life, I would learn. See, God was trying to get me not to do something that later I would regret. Have you ever heard that voice? Have you ever still done it? Did you regret it? <laughs> so God was speaking to Eve. I am fully persuaded of that. On her way over there, as she is journeying on over there, God was speaking. And we have a little quote here from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 53. It says this, The angels had cautioned Eve to beware of separating herself from her husband while occupied in their daily labor in the garden. With him she would be in less danger from temptation than if she were alone. But absorbed in her pleasing task, she unconsciously wandered from his side. On perceiving that she was alone, she felt an apprehension of danger. Have you ever, have you ever been about to do something and, and, and God would say, look, there's danger there. You're, you're going to regret it. There's going to be trouble. It's not going to be good. God was warning her. But listen what she did. She dismissed, dismissed her fears. Why did she do that? She decided that she had sufficient wisdom and strength to discern evil and to withstand it. Now, I cannot tell you how many times I've talked to people and rather it's marriage counseling or in a Bible study, and I find out that some of their lifestyle habits are not very healthy in regards to what they're watching, what they're listening to, things they're playing. And what I would hear from them as I would give them counsel on that is, I got this. It doesn't affect me. All along, ignoring the counsel that God has given in His Word, that by beholding we become change. And I would give them plenty of evidence and examples of it, and yet they would still go away and still partake of it. And we often do that. Why? Because we believe in our own feeble minds that we have sufficient wisdom and strength to discern evil and withstand it. Is that not true? Is that not how we think sometimes? Goes on to say, unmindful of the angel's caution, she soon found herself gazing with mingled curiosity and admiration upon the forbidden tree. I want to look at her. Follow along with me. Genesis 3, starting with verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than all the other, any other beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, has God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of all the fruits of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And then the serpent said, Oh, ye shall not surely die. I want to share with you, friends, what happened here was the longer Eve allowed the enemy to reason with her, he was able to sow within her mind doubt and disbelief to the point where she would reject the authority of God's Word. You see, let us never forget the position Satan once held as Lucifer. You read it in the book of Ezekiel. He was created perfect, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty, the seal of perfection. 
And, and in the commentary of Patriarchs and Prophets, in page 36, Ellen White would make this comment as she viewed his position, the honor, and the privileges God gave to him. She would say that his mind next to Christ was first among all the hosts of heaven. So don't forget this. Don't miss this. You have the mind of God, and then you have the mind of the next created, the, the being created, perfect, sealed, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty, but that rebelled. This is what we're dealing with. This is our enemy. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, friends. And so the counsel we're given in 2 Corinthians 10, 5 is that we're to cast down every imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bring everything into captivity and obedience to Christ. So how often does a thought come to our mind and we do not check it with our knowledge of God? And we just begin to enter into what I would call scenario thinking. And we allow the enemy to take our mind on a track until he is finally woven in an ideal, a thought that is contrary to the very will of God, and we buy into it. Friends, let us beware. He's out to sow his mind in your mind and mine. Verse 7, or verse 6 here, I mean. But the woman would ignore it, the warning of God. And when the woman, when the woman, <laughs> and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and she did eat. Now she didn't just sit there and eat it. You see, once her allegiance was broke with God, once the enemy persuaded her. To, to doubt God and to partake of what he was offering in place of what God had given and would continue to offer, she became a slave to him. You see, the enemy's goal is to get us to surrender our allegiance to God as sons and daughters that we may become slaves to him and an instrument in his hand that what we buy into, what we exchange for the goodness of God, what we exchange with the enemy that we will then go and share that with somebody else. And this is exactly what she did. Now let me ask you, do you think Eve believed she was on the wrong path as she was taking that fruit over to Adam? Do you think, she was, do you think that she knew that she was actually bringing him something that if he received would bring death? No, she did not. You see, in, in proportion, as she resi resisted conviction, her, discern her discernment was clouded and her desire to follow a course contrary to God was strengthened. You see, when we shun that conviction, we just strengthen ourselves in our own self-will. And we find ourselves doing something we never thought we would do. I'll give you some examples of this. How often as parents or grandparents or maybe you have with a friend, you've taken something, a movie, a piece of music, a, a game, something that promoted the attributes of Satan and you gave it to a child or you gave it to a friend thinking this would make them happy. They would like this. They would enjoy this. But yet all along, Unbeknown to you, unconscious maybe, you are handing them something that would promote death. I want you to think about this, friends. In Philippians 4, 8, it tells us that whatsoever things are good, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, of good report, praiseworthy, right? Think on these things. If there's something we're listening to, beholding, watching, playing, and it doesn't harmonize with the Word of God and it promotes the attributes of the enemy, let us get rid of it. But let us not give it off to somebody else. Jesus came, friends, to give us life and life more abundantly. How many believe that? How many believe that when he said the thief comes but to kill, steal, and destroy, that he meant it? Do you believe that? But is it possible that at times we allow the enemy 
to persuade us to distrust God's goodness, doubt his word, and reject his counsel. And in essence, we call him a liar saying, you don't have my best interest in mind. What the enemy is offering me in this world is much better. Sometimes we'll go to the point of persuading somebody else to take our side when we know it goes against the Word of God. We seek to justify ourselves. And then we seek to win others on our side to, to, to stand with us. And what we're doing is we're getting them to break their allegiance, compromise their allegiance with God, and they too will become an instrument in the hand of the enemy. Jesus has come to give us abundant life, friends. So I want to ask you, I want you to think about perhaps maybe has God revealed something to you that you have been partaking of that the enemy has persuaded you that that's the better thing in life than what God offers or what he has given? I want to encourage you to go home and pray about it. Don't shun the conviction. I've talked to people and they get really bent out of shape when you talk to them about music, when you talk to them about food or dress what they're reading, what they're watching, anything to do with lifestyle, people get pretty bent out of shape about it. But are we seeing, are we looking to see if what we are doing is harmonizing with the will of God? I'm going to read a quote here. It's very sobering. Christ Object Lessons, page 237. Because God, God wants us to submit to his will so that he can really bless us says, every time you refuse to listen to the message of mercy, how often? Every time. You strengthen yourself in unbelief. Every time you fail to open the door of your heart to Christ, how often? Every time. You become more and more unwilling to listen to the voice of him that speaks. What is the result? She says, you diminish your chance of responding to the last appeal of mercy. You see, in Proverbs 123, God would tell us, turn at my reproof, or he could say, turn at my correction, and I will pour out my spirit upon you, and I will make my words known unto you. God wants to give us abundant life through the presence of his Holy Spirit that he may guide and lead us into all truth. But when he comes and he convicts, Along with it, he wants to forgive us for our sins, but yet sometimes we are too stubborn and we just resist that conviction to the point where he cannot pour out his spirit for the sake of illuminating our minds with his words so that we'd better understand his will. And I want to encourage you to go home and read chapter 1 of Proverbs because there is a, a sad result that happens from not responding you see, we don't live on to ourselves. Everything we do, every interaction we have, sooner or later will impact somebody else's life. Eve would bring the fruit to Adam. And yes, he would partake of it. Verse 7, And their eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And, the, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. The eyes were opened, but how sad the opening, friends. You know, God never meant them to know evil. He never meant for any of us to know evil. But how heartbreaking do you think it is to God when we sit there and we just feast on it? And then we make excuses for it. It says this in the book of Education, page 25. The knowledge of evil and the curse of sin was all that the transgressors gained. There was nothing poisonous in the fruit itself. And the sin was not merely in yielding to appetite. It was distrust of God's goodness, disbelief of, disbelief of his word, and rejection of his authority that made our first parents transgressors. And that brought into the world a knowledge of evil. It was this that opened the door of, for every species of falsehood. An error. So the rejection of his goodness, distrusting his word, and not yielding to his authority. You see, that's what the enemy wants to get us to do. Let me ask you something. 
What one thing did God withhold from Adam and Eve? Remember, Satan said, you'll be as gods. Were they not created in his likeness and image? Yes? Did he give them dominion over the planet? Did he give them the ability to procreate? What did he withhold? One thing. And that was the prerogative to decide what is right and what is wrong, to self-govern. You see, only God has that authority. And when he says, don't do this, it's because he knows what's best for us. How many of you let your children, young on, growing up, teenagers, tell you what's right, what's wrong, and how things are going to be? Do you let them do that? What happens when they try? Do they learn to know who's in authority? They do. I know my son did, and I sure did at home as well. I want to point out something here, friends. God is good. And when we fall and falter, and for whatever reason buy into the lie of the enemy, and we find ourselves broken, weak, discouraged, overcome, enslaved, in bondage, he doesn't leave us alone. Amen? He comes looking for us. He would come to look for Adam and Eve, and God would say, where are you, Adam? Now, did God know where Adam was at? Was it, was it possible Adam could actually hide from God? Do you think God was calling out to him to get him to think about, what are you doing? I wonder if God is saying to some of us today, yea, maybe all of us today, where are you? What are you doing? Verse 10, and he said, I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. I was afraid. Are you afraid of God? Are you afraid to trust God? Yesterday, when I was walking in my backyard thinking about this sermon, and I was, I was looking at that phrase, I was afraid. I looked up, I thought, Lord, am I afraid to trust you? Did Adam not know God? Yes, there was a fear, all right. He knew the consequences that God said would be the result of eating the fruit. So perfect love cast out fear. So what happened in the garden, they would exchange a perfect love for a knowledge of sin. Are we doing the same thing, friends? Are we exchanging a perfect love or not desiring to, to, to enter into that perfect trust, that perfect encounter with God because we love sin? You see, there can be no perfect love between God and man if there's no perfect trust. So are you willing to trust them with your life? Are you afraid? Are you willing to trust them to, let, to tell you where you need to go? Or are you afraid? Are you afraid of what he's asking you to give up? Or perhaps afraid of what he's asking you to give, specifically talent, time, and treasure. Do you fear giving it up, sharing it, putting it on an altar for the Lord? Do we really believe when he's asking us these things, when, he, when he's given us the different counsel in his word, do we really believe he has our best interest in mind? Or are we afraid to trust the one that really loves us most? So they would compromise their allegiance to God. The enemy would then get a hold of them. And there would be a very interesting result. Verse 11. 
And he said, this is how he answered, Adam answered God. Or God said to him first, he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou should not eat? And what does the man say? How many remember this one? The woman that who you gave to me. She did give me of the fruit and I did eat. He asked the woman and the woman would say, oh, the serpent beguiled me. Why did you put the serpent here? Why did you let him be here? So a division would take place in their marriage. Don't miss this. Married couples, when you compromise a relationship with God, nothing but division can come in the house. Families, when you compromise on the counsel and the express will of God, nothing but division can come in the house. In the book of Judges, it would say when they chose other gods, there was war within their gates. Do you have strife in the home? Is there unrest? Maybe it's important that we do some self-reflecting on what's, what has priority in our lives. Division had been made. There was no respect and love for each other. Now, as I was sitting there yesterday thinking about all the things that has, have divided God's people, And, and how millions, millions of people were going down to a Christless grave because people were too focused on the division and taking sides and posturing themselves against one another, not at all fulfilling the prayer of Christ for unity, of course, unity will never come with compromise. Don't get me wrong. That will never happen. So let's look at a few things here that have divided our church. Has politics divided God's people? Yes or no? Was Jesus involved in politics? I didn't hear you. I didn't hear you. No, he was not. What was his focus? Revealing the Father's love. Do you think we might be a little off course? What about some of the biblical reflections we've had? Studies on the nature of Christ. You know, I was talking to one person, and, you know, me and him don't, maybe don't quite agree on it, but we, we talk and, and, and we enjoy one another and, and hanging out and, and talking about many different things besides that. And he told me one day, he says, you know what, I can count on one hand how many people I've been able to sit down and talk to about this that have treated me kindly. What about women's ordination? Has that divided God's church? What about COVID-19? What about the mask? Has that divided God's church? And now this next thing that has come up, and you know, don't, don't take it the wrong way here. I'm not saying you should or should not get the vaccine, but is it dividing God's church? I can't hear you, friends. Interesting, I had a call, somebody called me this week, somebody very close to me, and we were talking about things that were happening in the world, and um, the vaccine came up. And the person reminded, brought to my attention, I did hear it uh, about a week ago maybe, that the Michigan, uh, Michigan, state, Michigan state of Michigan was uh, allowing people to enter into a lottery that they could win $2 million and many other prizes if they got the vaccine. And he said to me, that should persuade everybody. And I said to him, it won't. And the next thing I heard was, Doo. he hung up on me. And, and, you know, I was thinking, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. Maybe our signal got dropped. So I tried to call the person back. They never answered the phone. And I thought to myself, 
Lord, may not this be a, a contention between us because it's not worth it. And a few minutes later, and it was about 20 minutes, I got a text message. I'm sorry. I'm struggling with this. I text the person back, and I said, you know what, I appreciate you acknowledging that you were wrong for hanging up on the phone, hanging up the phone, and recognizing the fact that there's a battle going on in your heart to allow somebody else to be fully persuaded in their own mind what they should do. Friends, what does the Bible say? Does it, does it not say we should be fully persuaded in our own mind on what to do in life? Let the Lord, let the Lord speak. How many believe that? I only saw a few hands. How many believe that? Amen. You see, you read Revelation 13, 17. Let's go there for a moment. I want to look at this passage. Revelation 13, 17. We're going to start with verse 16. And it says, and he causes all, speaking of the beast, and he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand and in their foreheads. And that no man might buy or sell, sell save he that had the mark, or what? It goes on to say, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. The name of the beast. I thought that was pretty interesting. What does name kind of represent in the Bible? Character. When Moses asked God, show me your glory, God said, I'll declare my name unto you. And then he would declare his name and he would proclaim different attributes that related to him. You see, one of the attributes of the beast is to control the conscience. To what? Control the conscience. When I was talking to that person and I explained that to him and I told him that was the result of 50 plus million people being murdered for what they believed in because they would not violate their conscience, the person was quick to say, well, that was the church. And I said, yes, it was the church. But unfortunately, they had a helper. And that was the civil authorities at the time. You see, it's that mindset that would seek to control, persuade, or, or by compulsion, get people to submit to their own mindset. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. I'm going to read a quote from Great Controversy 591. God never forces the will. How often? Never forces the will or the conscience. But Satan's constant resort to gain control of those whom he cannot otherwise seduce is compulsion by cruelty. Through fear or force, he endeavors to rule the conscience. And so today, maybe not everybody agrees on certain things but should you should you compel them should you force them should you make their life difficult through financial hardship or social hardship to get them to submit to the way you think is that right friends let it not once be named among us what spirit are we partaking of when we do can we I ask this question, can we disagree with someone and still treat them with love, dignity, respect, and kindness? Is that possible? No, it's not. Not without Christ dwelling in the heart. All things we can do through Christ who strengthens us. That is our only hope submitting to the God that loves us most that he may do the work in us to answer the very prayer he prayed for unity. We
We need an upper room experience, friends. When the disciples were in that upper room, when that group of people were in that upper room, there was a lot of heart searching taking place. And before God could pour out his spirit upon that group, reconciliation had to be made. I want you to think about who you may have offended. I'm thinking about it too. Who I may have offended, who you may have offended over the past several years, even up to this last week, because they did not agree with the position you took on something. Because God is calling us to reconcile, friends, and He cannot pour His Spirit out upon you or myself if we do not take those steps. Rather it be the person accept our apology and we receive forgiveness or not, but the effort must be made. Keep this in mind. While all this division is taking place, how many millions are going down to a Christless grave? How many? How many have to keep going down to a Christless grave while we do all this research and trying to posture ourselves only, for the posi- only to take the position to shame and force and compel somebody to believe like we believe? God have mercy on his church, friends. Acts of the Apostles says this. Jesus promised them the outpouring of his spirit. He told them, he told them to go and pray and wait. And when the Spirit of God was poured out, thousands were converted. The, the churches were being filled. And this is why. Every Christian, how many? Every Christian. We're not to be a Christian in name only, but in deed and actions and word as well. Every Christian saw in his brother a, rele- a revelation of divine love and benevolence. One interest prevailed. How many? One interest prevailed. One subject of emulation swallowed up all others. Do you want to know what it was? The ambition of the believers was to reveal the likeness of Christ's character and to labor for the enlargement of his kingdom. I don't know about you, but I'm praying that that's my sole purpose. That I would see in every person that Christ died for, a believer and a non-believer, an opportunity to share the likeness of Christ's character and to labor for the furtherance of his kingdom. If that's not our goal, then I would say we probably should just step away and drop the name Christian, lest we continue to bring reproach upon our Savior and crucify him afresh. Friends, God loves us, and he's inviting us to come to him and reason with him and open our heart to him as to a friend and and confess our challenges and our struggles like the person did on the phone. I'm sorry, I'm struggling with this. They were being honest, and I affirmed them in being honest. Because God can work with honesty. But if we're self-deceived, friends, he cannot help us. It's interesting, throughout Genesis there, all the way through that chapter, you will see that there was no remorse in Adam and Eve. They were not sorry. They did not take any responsibility for their actions. But I do believe this. I believe when Jesus stepped forward... And in that promise, they understood that he was going to take their place. Their heart was broken. Do we look to the cross? Is there remorse in our heart when we look and see what the Son of God endured for you and I so that we could be free? Friends, God's desire is to restore a perfect trust in him in place of doubt and rebellion. And unity among his people where we have exchanged love and respect for hate and kindness for bitterness. Let God do his work. As it says in James, submit yourselves therefore to God. But in order for you to do that, you have to know him. 
because you're not going to submit to somebody you don't know. So don't let the enemy absorb all your talent, time, and treasure on worldly things in exchange for a beautiful understanding and relationship with Jesus Christ. Submit to God because that's the only way we're going to resist the devil and it's the only time he will flee from us. Draw near to God, he will draw near to you and I. As it says, let us cleanse our hearts, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Let us not be double-minded, friends. Let us be afflicted and mourn. Let us weep. Let our laughter be turned to joy, turned to, to mourning, and your joy to heaviness. Because when we do, <laughs> when we humble ourselves, the Lord will lift us up. What do you say? In closing, I invite you to open your bulletin. There's a quote there I put in. It comes from a beautiful book, Steps to Christ. If you haven't read it or it's been a long time since you've read it, I want to encourage you to read it again. Steps to Christ, page 43. The whole heart, how much of the heart? The whole heart must be yielded to God or the change can never be wrought in us by which we are to be restored to His likeness. By nature, we are alienated from God. The Holy Spirit describes our condition in such words as these, dead in trespasses and sins. The whole head is sick. The whole heart is faint. There is no soundness, soundness in it. We are held fast in the snare of Satan, taken captive by him at his will. The only way we are ever going to be free fully and completely, and that's if we submit to God and allow him to do the work in our heart. It is God's desire to heal, to set us free. But since this requires an entire transformation, a renewing of the whole nature, we must yield ourselves wholly to Him. And that in itself, friends, we're going to need grace. But He's willing to give it. Now this last part, may we clearly understand this. The warfare against every one of our members, is that what it says? The warfare against self is the greatest battle that was ever fought and will be fought. You see, the battle's not with each other. The enemy's got us all crossed over. He's got us confused and messed up. The battle is with self, sin, and Satan. The yielding of self, the surrendering of the will to God requires a struggle. There's a battle taking place, a struggle with you and I, and that's what the person said on the phone. I'm struggling with this. But don't you know God's grace is sufficient? And He's able to do abundantly above all that we ask or think. The soul must submit to God before it can be renewed in holiness. Friends, let God do the work He desires to do. And let us recommit ourselves to Him and our allegiance to Him and be earnest on reconciliation among each other, praying for each other, and surrendering to the will of God. Amen? Amen. Amen.
loving Father, forgive us, Lord. Forgive us where we have exchanged all your goodness, all your blessings for the tinsel and the falsehood that the enemy would offer us in this world. Forgive us, Lord, where we have bought into his lies and deception, and as we have done, we've taken it, and we've shared it with somebody else, and doing so, we've caused nothing but division in our families, in our church, in our communities, in our nation, in our world, Lord. Forgive us, Lord. for being so stuck on self. That millions have gone down into a Christless grave because we refuse to yield to you. I'm asking, Lord, that you'll continue to work in each of our hearts, that that you'll lead us to reconcile where reconciliation needs to be made, first with you, and then with one another, that you may fulfill your desire in pouring out your spirit upon your church and binding us up together as one in Christ, that the world may know that you are truly among us and truly among this church for this time in earth's history. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to have a seat. We are going to have a um, dismissal song, and the deacons will dismiss from the back row coming forward, and then I invite you to go on out and enjoy the Sabbath. It's a beautiful day. I think it's a little cooler than it has been, but may God bless you. Thank you. Join me as we sing number 508, Anywhere with Jesus.